Good morning, church family. Welcome on this beautiful October morning with sun shining. Love it. Love you. Why don't you come on in and find a place? Everybody is welcome. And if you're like me, <clears throat> there's a lot of noise in your life. I feel like I, there's things I love about social media. I love seeing what's happening in people's lives. But it's also a lot of, huh, a lot just coming at us all the time. And just life itself. So I was thinking about this as I was preparing today, just the amount of noise <sighs> calling for our attention or the things that are weighing our minds down. And I am going to intentionally choose the best I can to lay that aside and push it back and just make space to meet with God, to hear his voice. I invite you to do that as well, to just take a minute right now and release what you need to release and push back so that you can be fully here. And I just feel like God has made so clear his desire to meet with us and to be with us. And I don't want us to miss that today. So please just enter in with all your heart. Take any position you want to for worship, but it's you and God. No audience is here. No audience. It is just us as a family, us as individuals, and God, our Father, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So join us today. saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught
whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to God, I need you.
come and fill us. We need a fresh filling. It just doesn't work to go on the old years ago filling. Or even a few days ago, God, we just invite you to fill us new Holy Spirit. Do what you want to do in our lives today. Help us to lay down anything that's blocking you, anything that's hindering you from doing the work you want to do in our lives. We just invite you. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus church family I just have my heart today that all of us have things that we need to speak the name of Jesus over. We're going to keep singing this song, but I just want you to know that the altars are open. If there's something you want to come and just put before the Lord, a family member, a personal need, a financial need, a physical need. We could pray for our brothers and sisters right now in the Ukraine. We could pray for Israel, the apple of God's eye. This world, this broken world, we see it all around us. Nothing will change all of those things except the power of God. And one way we bring the power of God into a situation is to speak his name and invite him in. So I'm going to start with that first verse again. And if you want to, if there's something pressing on you today, you're just invited. The altars are always open in this place. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name. Jesus, till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Over fear. Over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, 
Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. One more time, let's shout it. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shine. do that right now. We speak Jesus. Jesus, come. Jesus, fill us. Jesus, open our eyes. To see you in a new way. Grow us up, Lord. Maybe we've just been complacent. It's good enough. Oh, man, just fill us with such a hunger and a thirst for you, for more of you. We just invite you to make us uncomfortable today. We know you have something you want to do with us in this world, in this broken world. You want to use us, and we cannot do that without being filled. Filled fresh and anew every day, Lord, to walk out in these streets and among this community, bearing your name, and just um, letting our light shine for you. It's all about you. We lift up this broken world. We lift up Israel today. I pray all those that know your name there, would be, uh, that you would just be with them, that you would let their light shine. We know it's your heart's desire to bring those people to see you as Messiah. We just ask for mercy and we ask for your intervention and your protection over that nation. We pray for our nation, God. We can't turn the news on without just pretty much <clears throat> feeling some despair or maybe some cynicism. But you are a big God and you can do big things. And we just pray for our country, for all the leaders, um, for all your people that you would give us. Um, direction, discernment, and wisdom to walk as your people in an increasingly evil and perverse place. Help us not to compromise. We are so glad to be your children today. Help us today to remember what you've done for us, what you brought us out of, what you rescued us from, and break our hearts, Lord, for all those in our lives who still need you. Help us not to become weary in praying. <laughs> what is it you want to do today, Lord? I just want to stop for a minute and let you speak to us in the silence.
Forgive me, God, for all the times I just fill up the space with my voice. I want to hear your voice. We quiet ourselves before you now, trusting that you have something for us, a word, an encouragement, hope. Thank you for who you are for all you've done, for all you're going to do. We are yours, and we love you this morning. Amen. Church family, you may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all this morning? <coughs> Trust that you're well, even though maybe your coffee's not quite flowing. you told us that we were going to be in the book of Esther. Right. And that was the original plan. And God said, uh, yeah, no. Um, I have something else in store for my people. And right now I want you to journey through um, the book of Mark. And so uh, seeking to be obedient to the direction of the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves uh, in the book of Mark. So we're going to be looking at the first 15 chapters, excuse me, not chapters. <laughs> it be almost the whole book. Pretty ambitious. Uh, we'll be looking at the first 15 verses, but before we do that, I want to share a couple of announcements with you. Uh, I want to remind you that in your seat back in front of you, you should see a connection card, and that is a great way for us to be able to do exactly what it says, to connect with you, to be able to know how we can pray for you, how we can serve you, how we can love on you, for us to be able to know what God's doing in your life through a, a praise or what you need God to do in your life through a, a prayer request. And, and sort of the evidence of the beauty of us communicating to one another and praying for one another has been really beautifully played out for us this week. Uh, many of you know that Barbara had surgery earlier this week, and we prayed for her, we anointed her, we laid hands on her, and the surgeon said that it went as well as it possibly could have gone, and she is now home and up, down that road to recovery. And so that's because of your prayers. That's because of the mercy and the grace of God. And so we want to be a church that really loves and cares and serves one another. And in addition to that, Merrill also had some cancer removed um, this week. And the surgeons were pleased that they were able to get all of the cancer. And so that's just wonderful news about how God does, in fact, answer our prayers. And so I want to encourage you um, to let us know how we can, we can come before the throne of God's grace on your behalf. And ask the Lord to meet you exactly where it is uh, that you need him to meet you. And for us to be able to carry one another's burdens means that we have to know what's going on. In addition to that, we gather together, the, a lot of us do, on Wednesdays. And we have a meal together. And we take some time. And we, we're, we're sharing stories. We're getting to know each other on a deeper level. Then we're seeing how our story intersects with God's story. And about how he's shifting and shaping and changing us and the way that we respond to the brokenness of this world. And we take some time to have some dialogue and some conversation over the sermon that was previously preached. And so if you've never joined us on a Wednesday night, I would encourage you to come and have a meal and, and come together and, and hear the stories and the lives of, of those that we are fellowshipping with, that we call brothers and sisters in the church. And then for us to go a little bit deeper to find out how God wants to apply the truths that we're learning on Sunday mornings to our life directly. And so uh, one of the ways you can do that is just by joining us. If you have a student, we have a beautiful youth group that's going on. They come and they eat with us and then they come in the sanctuary and they do all the youth groupy things. Um, in addition to that, they're also studying and going through the book of Romans right now, which is uh, pretty theologically deep, to be honest with you. And so I'm excited to, to see how God is working in our students. And it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, a couple other ways that we can connect here at the church is Coming up um, for Halloween, uh, we are going to be doing a Halloween outreach, and we're going to be meeting at Manita's house because Manita lives in like the Mecca of all things whitefish 
sort of Halloween. And so uh, one of the ways that you can help us with that, here's a couple ways, you can bring candy. Now, here's my caveat. See, God, when he gives, he gives his best. Amen? So when we give, if we want to be like God, we also need to give our best. And what that means is none of those cheap little Tootsie Roll things, because Tootsie Rolls are not of God. Okay, they're part of the fall, Genesis 3. Um, but we want like the full on, not those little tiny candy bites, but like at least the decent snacks. Yeah, and I, that's what I'm talking about. There you go, Julia. You know, the big jumbo candy because we want to give our best. And you can keep all of your Tootsie Rolls at home and at the store, okay? Uh, not that I have anything against Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> Um, or anything like that, but uh, anyway, and so that's one of the ways, and then in addition to that, two weeks from today, following service, we're going to be doing some decorating, decorating in the fellowship hall in preparation for our, uh, our Halloween outreach, so if you want to plan on staying and joining us, we're going to be painting some things, our theme is going to kind of be Mario Kart, and we're going to be coming up with different ideas to uh, put together outfits. Now, here's the thing. We would love for you to come, and we would love for you to come dressed up in the Mario Kart theme, but if you just come dressed up, that's awesome. If you just come, that's awesome as well. So we're going to have a fire pit, and there's going to be hot cocoa, and it's going to be wonderful, and so we're not only going to serve our community, but we're also going to have fellowship together, and it should just be a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful time. In addition to that, if you want to go to Paraguay, extend the love of Jesus on a mission trip, that's coming up. We actually have two offerings, two options, one in May and one at the beginning of uh, June to be able to go and to serve with our district um, on the district level to help our missionaries, the Stearns, in building a actual church facility. If you have questions about that, you can go and see um, Heidi. She knows all things Paraguay mission trip. But I do know this, a $500 non-refundable deposit is due November 1st. Yeah, so that's coming up here pretty quick. So if you do have questions, um, ask them soon uh, and then get that deposit in and plan on going down there to extend the love of Jesus there. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to thank you again for your faithful giving that makes us meeting and gathering in this beautiful facility and, and actually having heat and all of those wonderful things and these beautiful chairs possible. And so thank you for allowing us to be able to extend the love of Jesus in Whitefish, in Columbia Falls, in Kalispell, and to the surrounding areas, and to the entire world. And it's because of your generous giving that we're able to do that. And so with that, let me pray, and then we're going to jump in and see what the Lord has for us this morning uh, in the book of Mark. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful, wonderful, glorious opportunity for us to gather around your word, to gather around the truths that you've spoken to us, and to open our lives, our minds, our hearts, and our Bibles to hear from you, to be changed, transformed by you. And so, Jesus, would you come and make yourself beautiful? Holy Spirit, would you come and illuminate the work of Jesus in our lives, that we might be forever changed? And it's in your beautiful name that we pray these things, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you got your Bibles open up, opened up to the book of Mark. Chapter 1. Now, some people might call these first 15 verses in the book of Mark sort of the, the foreword to the rest of the book. And so what Mark is doing is he's beginning to sort of set up what's going to happen in the rest of his narrative. In fact, the, the book of, Ar, of Mark is one of the earliest um, of the four Gospels and manuscripts that we have. And the book of Mark actually becomes the primary source from which Matthew and Luke draw from. So Mark is written first, and what Matthew and Mark do is they sort of draw from what Mark has already written. It's what's known theologically as the synoptic gospels, meaning that there's a lot of similarities because both Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark. Does that make sense? And then you have John, the apostle John, who his gospel is just off in left field altogether. It's beautiful, but it's, it, it's his account, and he doesn't borrow from anybody but his own account with Jesus. And so you might be familiar with the author of the book of Mark. His name is actually John Mark. He was a traveling companion with Paul and Barnabas. But if you'll recall, during the missionary journeys, they have this sort of sharp disagreement between the two of them. And, of course, if you know the story, then you know John Mark went with Barnabas. 
But we also know that later on, Barnabas, or John Mark gets back with Paul, and Paul reaffirms John Mark. And then later on after that, John Mark becomes an interpreter for Peter. And so really what we're going to see throughout the book of Mark is there's a lot of Peter involved because really it's Peter's account. And so what John Mark is doing is he's writing down and sort of interpreting what Peter is sharing about his experience with Jesus. And so it's this beautiful picture of sort of Peter's journey with Christ. Now, we know that we've been traveling in 1 Peter over the past, I don't know, nine weeks or so. We know the heart of Peter, and we're going to see sort of his account and his experience with Jesus through the book of Mark. Now, we know that what's happening here during the writing of this particular gospel is that John Mark finds himself in Rome, and during that particular uh, point in time, Nero is in power. Now, I, I tell you that, and I want you to focus on that because it's important for us to keep that in mind for a few reasons. Uh, number one, you're going to recognize that Peter plays a significant role in this story because it really is kind of his story. Um, the other is that what we're going to see in the book of, of Mark is that there's this sense of urgency. There's this rapid movement. In fact, there's in the book of Mark, there's the word immediately shows up 42 times. Why? Because there's this sense of urgency. Things are moving along. And so when we look at the book of Mark, what we see is not as much of Jesus' teaching as we see his actual life lived out. If you look at Matthew and and Luke, you you see more of Jesus' teaching. In the book of Mark, you see this urgency about what Jesus actually did in his life. And so things are moving along. You can think of the book of Mark as sort of the ADHD gospel. Any of you sort of short on on attention? Well, then the book of Mark is is for you because it's constantly moving and moving and moving. And it focuses on the life of Jesus and what he does. Uh, The other thing that I want us to notice in the book of Mark is that Mark is going to help us to understand that Jesus is a, a very different kind of king. That when Jesus comes, he comes unexpectedly. So much so that they had expected the Messiah, this coming king of Israel, to come and to sort of take over politically when what Jesus does is he comes and he serves sacrificially. Because Jesus knows that our biggest problem is not what is happening politically, but what's happening to us spiritually. That because of our sin, because of our brokenness, we stand separated from God. And we need a king that will come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so what what Mark is going to do is he's going to sort of put up Jesus as king against some of the different kings and rulers of the day. And that even though the kings of this world do horrific things, we have a king of kings who always does good things. And so we can trust him. We can look to him. And so I really wanted to call this series in the book of Mark unexpected because that's exactly what Jesus is. That's exactly what Jesus does. He comes and does the unexpected. Jesus is rarely what we ever expect. And it's possible for us to miss the Messiah if we're looking for him to meet our expectations rather than looking to the scriptures by God's word and God's spirit to show us what our expectation of the king ought to be. And too often what happens is we get poor teaching or we are shaped by our own experiences and we think that God should come meet our expectations in a certain way when in fact we need to allow the scriptures and the spirit to show us what our expectation should be. And so all of that is sort of a quick intro to the book of Mark. And so let's read the first verse together. It says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's stop there. We didn't get very far. Uh, This is the sort of the intro statement to the book. And and I just want to walk you through the first couple of words because they're so vitally important. First of all, Mark starts with the words in the beginning, the beginning. 
Now, if you know your Bible, what does this hearken back to? Where else do we see in the scriptures the, the beginning? What does this remind you of? Genesis, right? So immediately, Mark is giving us a clue that what's happening in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus, is that Jesus is going to become the true fulfillment of the first three chapters of Genesis. And so what, what he's doing is he's showing us that this is sort of a new creation narrative. And, and this is what's going to begin to take place. And what we're going to see is that there are these parallels that we see in these first 15 verses to the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And so immediately, Mark's giving us this clue that it's, it's in the beginning. There's this new creation narrative, and that chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis are going to be fulfilled in Jesus showing up. And, and you'll notice there's these parallels. He continues, and he says this. He says, the beginning of the gospel. Now, what's interesting is we toss that word around pretty loosely, don't we? Gospel, gospel, gospel. And yet, I think often, if we're not careful, we don't take the time to truly understand what the gospel means and what the implications of the gospel are. Now, how many of you know what the word gospel means? It means good news, good news. So it's, it's good news. Now, that word gospel in the day and age that Mark is writing would have been a pretty familiar word to them. It would have been something that uh, they would have heard often. In fact, it was something that would have been used whenever there was good news being spread about a victory that took place uh, on the battlefield. Heralds would come back and they would tell of the victory, the, the good news that the war has been won. Other times that word would be used um, to sort of celebrate or declare a ruler's birthday. So, for instance, Caesar Augustus was hailed as a god to people. Not, not Jesus, but, but Caesar. And so his birthday signaled, and this is the exact language that they would use, the beginning of the good news of the world, speaking of Caesar Augustus. Do you hear the parallel here? But listen to what Mark is saying. The beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, a, a significant distinction between the good news of Jesus and the good news that they would have been used to hearing in sort of this Greco-Roman world. So when, whenever in the Greco-Roman world they would talk about good news, it was always used in the plural, meaning more than one good news, meaning that this was one of many good newses. But in the Gospels and all throughout the, the New Testament, when it talks about the good news of Jesus, it's singular, meaning that this is the only good news. There is no other good news than the good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus has come to proclaim. This is what Mark is coming to proclaim. And the good news is not something that we do for ourselves. The good news is what God has done for us. And that this good news is not just something that happens, but this good news is someone that has come to us. And so what Mark wants us to know is the gospel is not just this sort of random ethereal idea, but that the gospel is a person, that all of the good news of the gospel is wrapped up in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Without Jesus, there is no gospel. Without Jesus, there is no good news. And so the moment we talk about gospel is the moment it's synonymous with who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so what Mark is doing is he's qualifying Jesus as the good news. Now, let me remind you of this as well, that the word or the name Jesus, what does that mean? God saves. God is salvation. So Jesus, God is salvation. Salvation is our God who saves. The good news is that our God is salvation. This is what Mark wants us to know. And so he's qualifying this. He's showing us this. And that's why Mark begins by saying, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the beginning of the good news that God is salvation. 
paints this beautiful picture that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of the biblical scriptures. All of what has been promised in the Old Testament is now being accomplished in Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, many of the Jews thought that they knew what to expect when this Messiah came, when this Savior came. And the problem is every single one of them missed it. In fact, what you're going to find in the, in the book of Mark is that nobody really recognizes who he is. They all sort of miss him. Even Peter, who thinks he gets it right in chapter 8 when he calls Jesus the Christ, he doesn't recognize that Christ has come uh, not to conquer uh, politically, but Christ has come to suffer. And do you remember when Jesus is sharing with Peter that, that the, the way of the king, the way of the Messiah is to the cross? And Peter says, oh, no, that's not going to happen. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. And so even Peter misses it. He kind of gets it, but he, but he misses it. In fact, the main instance where we see who gets who Jesus actually is, is in the demons. They know who he is. They know he's the Messiah. They know that God is salvation. They know exactly why he's come, and they shudder in fear, and they tremble. We also fast forward. It isn't until after he dies on the cross when there's a... a um, Gentile uh, Roman centurion who says, after Jesus takes his last breath, surely this was the Son of God. See, why did they miss him? Well, because he didn't come to meet their expectations. He came to meet a greater expectation. He came to deal with a bigger issue than just what was happening circumstantially in the world. He came to deal with our sin that separates us from God. Why? Well, because we often miss that sometimes the way to salvation is through suffering. And they didn't want to believe that this king, this Messiah was going to come and was going to suffer because that seemed weak. It didn't seem strong. According to worldly standards, that's what they thought would happen. And what Mark is telling us is that the only way that we can really understand Jesus is if we get to the cross. That if we don't find ourselves on the way to Jerusalem with Jesus to the cross in which he dies for our sins, rising again on the third day, if you don't get to that, then you don't get to Jesus. Why? Well, because that is at the heart of what it means for Jesus to be the good news, for God to bring salvation. He has come to rescue us from the greatest enemy that we experience, which is Satan, sin, and death. And so Mark is giving us sort of a clues throughout this whole thing that, that really the cross becomes the magnifying glass of the glory and reality and beauty of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That without the cross, without his suffering, there is no salvation. So, Let's walk through what Mark intends to show us. Today, we're going to consider three things, three things that the unexpected king did. Number one, he was prepared in his preparation. He was identified by his identification, and he overcame Satan through his temptation. Okay, those are the three things that we're going to look at. Number one, let's look first at his preparation. Go to verse two. Here's what we hear as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, remember, Mark is primarily writing to a Gentile audience. He's in Rome. Most of these people are not Jewish. And so it's no surprise that as we continue to journey through the book of Mark, he doesn't reference the Old Testament a lot because that wouldn't have meant much to his readers. And you say, okay, well, that doesn't seem to line up because right away here in verse 2, what's he doing? He's referencing the Old Testament. You go, okay, well, why in the world is he doing that as part of his forward to this good news of Jesus? Why is he sharing the Jewish um, scriptures with them? Here's why. Because what Mark is wanting to do is to make sure that we understand that the plan of salvation and the gift of Jesus was not an afterthought. 
He wants all of us to understand, and he wants the Gentiles in Rome to understand that it wasn't like God went, oh, no, Adam and Eve blew it. Israel didn't follow through with what I called them to do. The kings have all fallen short. The prophets can't give a, a, a full and final definition of who I am, and so I better figure something out. No, he wants them to understand that this was the plan before the foundations of the earth, was that Jesus would come and live the life we couldn't live, Die the death that we deserve to die so that God would receive honor and glory because of this good news, because of this plan. And so our salvation and God coming for us is not an afterthought. Before the foundations of the earth, God chose us. He knew that he was going to make a way for us. And so that's what's, what's going on. Mark wants us to know and understand that this plan has been on God's mind from the beginning. And so he starts there, but, but he also quotes, um, the text here says that he quotes uh, Isaiah, but it's a little misleading because he actually quotes three different Old Testament um, pendings. One of them is from Isaiah, but he quotes Exodus 23, 20, Malachi 3, 1, and Isaiah 40, verse 3. Now, keep in mind that as we walk through this, um, what is the wilderness what does the desert signify for God's people? Do you remember? What does God use the wilderness or the desert when they're wandering around to do? Okay, John the Baptist is coming. He's in the wilderness. He's preparing the way of the Lord. What, what does God use the wilderness to prepare his people to do in the book of Exodus? Okay, he's preparing them. He's purifying them. He's preparing them to enter into the promised land, and so this is very intentional. And what, what Mark is doing is he's drawing us back to these sort of parallels. He's saying before God used the desert and the wilderness to prepare his people to enter into the promised land. Because if you'll remember the story, God hears his people's cry. They've been in you know Egypt for 400 years. They've been in slavery. They cry out to God. God hears them. He sends Moses to come and deliver them. And now they've been delivered out of Egypt, but now God spends 40 years taking Egypt out of them. Welcome to this beautiful thing we call sanctification. Because, yes, they, they had been in Egypt, and while they had been there for so long, much of the culture, much of, uh, of what they had experienced was being shaped by Egyptian culture. And so now God is going to use them to prepare them for 40 years to lead them into the promised land. Now, the interesting thing is, is most scholars believe that that trip from Egypt to the promised land was about an 11-day journey. How long did it take them? 40 years. Why? Because they're just like us. Stubborn, stiff-necked, and self-centered. And so God is going to use this period of 40 years to continue to test them and teach them and prepare them for what he has for them before they enter into the promised land. And it begs the question, not a very popular question, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. What is it that God is seeking to teach you that should only maybe take a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, but we just keep circling the wagons? And we're wandering, and we're in the desert, and he's still preparing us and sanctifying us and, and shaping us. What, what is it in our lives where we're still not quite believing God in this area of our life, and we're not entering into his rest, we're not entering into um, his leadership in this area of our lives, and so we continue to wander? What is it for you? I know what it is for me. And maybe there's been several things where, yeah, you start doing really good in this area, and, and then God reveals to you another thing. And you're like, oh, man, I thought we got a break for a while. But God is more interested in who he's creating us to be through our character than he is in how comfortable we are. And so he allows us to wander through the wilderness. Now, now keep in mind that as that takes place, what is God doing for his people? He's providing for them. He's feeding them. He's, he's leading them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He's protecting them. He's still with them, but he's shaping them and preparing them. 
And so we need to keep that in mind that, that God is preparing his people once again, and he's preparing his son for what he's about to do. Because in Exodus chapter 23, verse 20, there's a messenger who goes before God's people. Do you remember? You remember the messenger? God says, I'm going to send my angel. And do you remember which angel this is? It says, it's the angel of the Lord. Now, most commentators believe that in the Old Testament, anytime the angel of the Lord is referenced, this is a picture of the pre-incarnate Jesus. And so what God has done is, is he sent Jesus in the Old Testament, named as the angel of the Lord, to come and to, to go before them so that they can have victory as they enter into Cana and so that they can enter into the promised land. And so that's, that's really what's taking place here. There's this preparation that's taking place. Now, here's another caveat. Where's John the Baptist when this is happening? Do you remember? But where's all of this happening? Where, where's John right now? He's in the desert. He's in the wilderness. And he's going to be baptizing people here in a few, few moments as we keep reading. And where is he baptizing them? In the Jordan River. Okay, that's very significant. Because where did God's people enter into the promised land? Through what? Through the Jordan River. You think that, is that a coincidence? No, God doesn't leave anything to coincidence. So here's what he's saying. He's saying that you were supposed to enter into my rest, but you didn't. Okay? The writer of Hebrews says, the reason you never entered into <clears throat> the rest that God had for you is because of your unbelief. And it's almost like God is saying, <clears throat> okay, we're going to do this again. We did this once, and we're going to do this again. We're going to go through the Jordan again, but this time it's going to be the one who truly knows how to rest. And when you enter into him, Jesus, when you put your life in him, when you put your hope in him, then you will find true rest. <clears throat> then you will find true Sabbath. So he's bringing us around to this. So Jesus is going to come to the Jordan where John is baptizing. He's preparing the people of God for his arrival. Now, <clears throat> the name Jesus can also be translated as Yeshua, which also in the Old Testament means what? Okay, yep, and who else? Who, what, what other name would be synonymous with that in the Old Testament? Joshua, yeah, exactly. And who's the one who led God's people across the Jordan River? Joshua did, okay? Joshua, so, so there's no accidents here. Joshua in the Old Testament is the one who is going to lead God's people into the promised land. In the New Testament, Jesus, Yeshua, is going to lead God's people through the Jordan into the ultimate promised land. What is Mark doing? Well, Mark is beginning to awaken us to the work that God's been doing for a long time. And as readers, we should go, okay, wait a minute. There's a bigger story than just what we're seeing in these few verses. There's a bigger story that's being encapsulated in what's happening just in these first three or four verses. It's hearkening back to a greater story, a grander story, to God's story, which is why story is so important. Because when we understand God's story, when we understand our story and how those come together, and we understand other people's stories, it helps us to see and understand how God wants to shape us through his story. That our story finds itself inside of a bigger story, a grander narrative. And when we look to God's story, all of a sudden our story begins to make sense. And really the story of God is fourfold. You have creation. You have the fall. You have redemption. And ultimately you have renewal. And every single one of us finds that, those same fourfold moves in our own life. We're all looking towards something as our creation story. But we've all fallen. We all need redemption. And ultimately, all of us, our hearts are longing for renewal and restoration that can only be found in Jesus. Look with me at verses 4 through 6. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin 
And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Now, what's going on here? Okay, there, there's a baptism, and it's a baptism of repentance. For what? Well, Mark just told us, for the forgiveness of sin. Now, this baptism that Mark is talking about here should point us back to Mount Sinai. You remember in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, where God calls his people into a covenantal relationship where he says that he will be their God and they will be his people and, and that we would be for him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We would be a people where God would use us to speak reconciliation to the world, where we can be made right with God. We can come under God's care and we can become a part of God's people, a holy nation set apart on the earth. Now, if you'll remember in chapter 19 of Exodus verse 10, the, the Israelites signify their acceptance of this covenant relationship with God by washing their clothes, purifying themselves, and entering into this covenant with God at Mount Sinai. So what you have here is you have John the Baptist going, okay, we said that we would keep the promise, we would keep the, the covenant, but we didn't. And so let's repent. Let's go back to God. Let's turn to him. Let's ask for forgiveness. Let's let the water of the Jordan serve for us as a reminder that we need to be cleansed from sin and that we need to re-enter into a covenant relationship with God through the Jordan River. And so that's what's going on here. Mark is pointing us all back to those things. And, and we know that that baptism is, is an external reality that points to a deeper internal reality, right? And so what, what John is doing is he's preparing people through this outward symbol of what would ultimately happen inwardly. In verse 7, and he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now let me remind you, this is, this is what slaves would do. They would come and they would untie your sandals. They would wash your feet. Here's what John is saying. I'm not even worthy to be the Messiah slave. That's how amazing he is. I'm not even worthy. He's that much mightier than I am. John says, I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so John knows that he is a servant of Jesus. He also knows that the baptism that he offers is only pointing to an outward decision and desire, not an internal change. But what he knows is that when Jesus comes and baptizes with the Holy Spirit, that's where true trans transformation change happens. That's where we receive a new heart. We receive a new power. We begin to live holy lives. We begin to be changed forever because of Jesus. We can't miss this. All of this is wrapped up in these verses, in these passages. God is drawing near to us. And he's drawing near to us because he wants to change us, and he wants to change us forever. And he forever wants to dwell in our hearts by faith, purifying us, cleansing us from all guilt, all shame, empowering us to live a brand new life, to live a sanctified life, a life set apart, walking in the ways of Jesus as led by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of that is summed up in baptism. Isn't it amazing? God's word is absolutely amazing. And so let me remind you, family, when you come up out of the baptismal waters, I want us to understand that, that we are proclaiming that we believe we have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we actually have the power to change with new desires and new longings and a new heart. With a new power to, to no longer need to follow the ways of this world and, and our own brokenness, but instead to follow the way of Christ to be changed, to be transformed. And I think John's baptism is really a beautiful picture of, of being transformed by the reality of who Christ is. But it begs the question, do you want to be baptized by Jesus? Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you truly want to change? I talk to a lot of people who love the idea of being saved from their sin and going to heaven. But they don't love the idea of being led and empowered by the Holy Spirit 
he now gives us new desires with a new longing and a new direction where Jesus is not just your Savior, but he's also your Lord. And this is part of what John is calling us back to. This is part of what Mark is pointing us to. Do you want a new mind? Do you want a new heart? Do you want new desires? Do you want a new life? Because this is what Jesus does as he fills us with the power of his Holy Spirit. And so I'm praying that over the next, I don't know, 30 weeks or however long we're in the book of Mark, that God will help us to see Jesus in a new light and that we will hunger for him, that we will thirst for him, that we will love him and worship him and give our lives to him over and over and over and over again. Not because we need to be saved over and over again, but because we need to remain in his love over and over again. Because we have this uncanny way of sort of wandering through the wilderness and wandering off, and and what we need to do is we need to remain in his love. So now let's consider how Jesus, the king, is identified. Look at how he was prepared. Let's look at how he's identified. Look at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, in Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. Why in the world is Jesus being baptized? John just got done saying that they were, or Mark just got done saying that John was baptizing, and it was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, Jesus never sinned. Did Jesus need to be baptized because he needed to be washed and purified from his sin? Absolutely not. So then it begs the question, Why in the world is Jesus allowing John to baptize him? Well, what we begin to see here is the humility of our God and Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Jesus is not going into the River Jordan. He's not going to be baptized by John so that because he needs the forgiveness of sin. No, he's doing it to identify with us sinners. It's this beautiful picture that God looks at our brokenness and he sees that we need help and he doesn't just try to fix it from while he's far off and aloof in heaven. No, he comes in the person, the work of Jesus and he identifies with our brokenness. He steps into our brokenness. And so what Jesus is doing through this baptism is he's saying, look, I'm identifying with you because I love you and I want to care for you. It's, it's the ultimate humility of God. And so what he's doing is he's saying, I, I identify fully with your brokenness by entering into baptism. That you do need to repent. You are a sinner. And I've come to be with you, to deliver you out of that. This is the amazing humility of God. Why? Well, he had to identify with our rebellion. He had to put himself in that place so that he could take our sin. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says that, speaking of Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. See, if Jesus doesn't identify with us in our sin, we cannot identify with him in in his righteousness. And this is what Jesus is doing. It's identifying with sinners. Though he never sinned, he's entering into our brokenness and he's going to live the life we cannot live and die the death that we should die so that on the cross and through faith, we, it's this great exchange that we receive his righteousness and he receives our sin. And he receives on the cross the due just penalty for sin, which is the wrath of God being poured out upon Jesus Christ. Someone has to pay for the penalty of sin. It will either be us for eternity, separated from God, or it will be Jesus receiving that sin, that brokenness for us, that we might receive the righteousness of Jesus. Let let me loop back and, and, and say this. Bear with me. We, as Christians, need more than just the death of Jesus on the cross. We need more than his sacrifice. You say, well, that that wouldn't have been enough. You say, well, that that sounds like heresy. Okay, bear with me. 
we also needed his perfect life. Because had Jesus not come and lived the perfect life and identified with us in our brokenness, then that great exchange would have never been able to take place. So he had to come, live the perfect life, so that when he died on the cross, he could conquer Satan, sin, and death, and we could trade places with him. He receives the just due penalty of sin, which is death and the wrath of God being poured out on the Son of God so that we can receive his perfection, his righteousness, so that when God looks at us through faith, he sees us not as we are, he sees us as Jesus has done for us. This is the gospel. This is why it's good news, and there's only one good news, and Jesus is the good news, and all of this is wrapped up in what he has done for us. And so we needed his perfect life. We needed him to identify with us. We needed his sacrificial death. We needed him to absorb the wrath of God for us. I ask people often, I say, what is God saving you from? Well, my sin. Okay, yeah, that's one thing. What else is God saving you from? What is the penalty of your sin? Death. Okay, and how does that play out? By the wrath of God being poured out on you. Now, that is the most unpopular thing in the North American church right now, but it's biblical and it's true, and we need to understand it because that's the depth of God's love for you. That God himself, Jesus, came and absorbed that wrath. For us. And not just so that we could barely scoot by, so that we could experience the righteousness and the power and the presence in a life of holiness by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, God always gives his best, which is why we should always give our best. And so what Mark is doing is he's showing us that the only way that we can become and experience the righteousness of God is if Jesus identifies with us and lives a perfect life we can't live and dies the sacrificial death that we deserve to die. And so Jesus comes and he does that and he's baptized to identify with us and he serves us and he loves us and he sacrifices himself for us. It's good news. It's the gospel and it's amazing. Verse 10. He comes up out of the water, and immediately the heavens are torn open, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So Mark is showing us this picture that God is speaking over Jesus, announcing that this is his true king, his true servant, his true and better Israel. This is his true son. That Jesus now has the power in his physical body to be everything that everyone needs. To be the true son of God. To be the true servant of all. To be the true king who has come to extend the rule of God throughout all of the world forever and ever. Amen. And here's what's crazy. And we shouldn't be surprised by this, but we are. Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. What does the spirit do now? Verse 12, immediately drove him into the wilderness to suffer. We go, wait a minute. I thought when I came to Jesus, life was going to be good. Life was going to be easy. You know, I was going to be rich and wealthy. And what do you mean to suffer? Okay, we just got done hearing that, that God has So this is my true servant. This is my true son. He's the one through whom which I'm going to do this. I am pleased with him. He has my spirit. And what does the spirit do? He leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted and to suffer. Man, what a beginning, huh? Wow. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now go and suffer. Crazy. Mark continues, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, it shouldn't be surprising to us if we know the story, if we know the, the creation narrative. What happens at the very beginning in Genesis? Adam and Eve are there. The enemy comes. What does he do? He tempts them, and they fail fail. Instead of taking their position of power, instead of submitting to God and loving God with all of their hearts, mind, soul, and strength, instead of looking to God as the one who only can give them hope, 
strength and provision instead of submitting to what he asks of them? See what they have and they think that they can do better on their own. They don't want to live for God's glory. They want to live for their own glory. And what do they do? They rebel. So now Jesus is now driven out to do what Adam and Eve were supposed to do. But what they couldn't do to overcome Satan on our behalf. And it's a 40-day trial, which we know from Scripture, um, there's this theme about the importance of 40 days, particularly in the Old Testament. Because if you'll, remind, if you'll, if you'll remember, God always attaches something to these 40 days, 40, or to, to, the, to the number 40. 40 years in wandering in the wilderness, Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, Elijah is led for 40 days and nights to Mount Horeb. We know with um, Noah, it's 40 days in the ark. It's a significant number of testing and preparation. And so now what is Jesus going to do? He's now going to go for 40 days to overcome Satan on our behalf. And here's the good news. He's going to win. He's going to win. Where, where Adam and Eve failed, where we fail, Jesus does not. He's victorious for us. He doesn't give in. He doesn't believe the deception. He overcomes. He submits to the Father's will. He lives for the Father's glory and for the Father's purpose. And he doesn't use his sonship in a way um, to be something other than what God intended it to be, which is to bring glory to the Father. See, not only does Jesus identify with us, but Jesus also overcomes for us. Where we fail, where we fall short, Jesus doesn't. And that's why it's good news. And that's why the gospel is Jesus. And that's why we need Jesus all the way. And so this is the beginning of the king's story. Crazy, huh? Beautiful. Listen to what he says after his victory over Satan and sin. Mark says this. After this, John was arrested. Now, there's a little tagline that we'll come back to later on in a few weeks. But Mark's trying to let us understand here that uh, John did the work he was supposed to do, and now he's going to get killed. And that's going to be a common theme throughout the book of Mark. It's like you think, well, I, I thought Jesus came to bring me comfort and safety, and, and yet I still died. Everybody who followed Jesus, they're ultimately going to get persecuted. So he's letting the people in Rome be assured that just because you're going through difficulty, just because you're experiencing suffering, doesn't mean that God is not with you and that God is not for you. John knows, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Speaking of Jesus. Here's John paving the way for this Messiah and he's arrested and murdered. Don't believe the lies that the world tells us that, that God has come and if you have faith in Jesus, it's all going to be easy. You're going to be rich and healthy and everything's going to be perfect. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Now, it might happen, but that's not what God promises. Jesus promised that there would be persecution, that there would be suffering and rejection, and that we would need to take up our cross and follow him. So that's just a little caveat there. We'll get to that more later on in a couple weeks. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, verses 14 and 15. Here's what Mark is saying. Uh, Jesus didn't come like we all expected. He came announced by a woolly man. He was baptized in a dirty river and he was driven out to be harassed in the wilderness by wild beasts. But don't miss it. He overcame. He won. He had victory, and it's our victory. That's why we can say that the kingdom of God isn't some far off and aloof reality. The kingdom of God is here and now in Jesus, and Jesus is in us, which means the kingdom is in us. And so we can have hope. We can extend hope. We can give that hope. Why? Because Jesus overcame. He's the victorious one, and that's good news. And so Jesus is saying that I am the good news. 
Jesus is the gospel. So how do we respond? Well, John tells us, here's how we respond. Repent. Repent. You go, I, I, I did that once. <laughs> As if that was enough. You only needed to change your mind once, huh? I sure hope you're continuing to change your mind, which is the essence of the word repentance. And repentance is simply this. It's recognizing that there are certain areas in my life where I am not aligned with what God wants for my life. And I'm living in areas of disobedience, whether it's something I do that I shouldn't do or something that I should do that I don't do. And the moment that we recognize those things, we need to surrender them to the Spirit of God. We need to be thankful for the sacrifice of the Son of God, and then we need to be obedient to bring glory to God the Father. And so repentance is simply a change of mind, recognizing that there are areas in my life where I'm not lining up with God's will for my life. And I need to to turn. I need to go the other direction. I need to repent. I need to turn from whatever other things or other people I'm looking to to bring me hope and acceptance and salvation. And instead, I need to turn to Jesus. And over the next 30 plus weeks, as we walk through the book of Mark, we are going to continually come back to this reality. Why? Because we continually need our hearts and our minds to be changed. We continually have areas in our lives where where God wants to continue to shape us and change us. And and just as Julie said earlier, we don't want to live on yesterday's manna. Or, or yesterday's experience, we want to have a fresh, new outpouring of the Holy Spirit as he's leading us. And the only way we can experience that is through a life of faith and repentance. Repentance, changing our mind, knowing that we need to go a different way, believe a different thing. We need to align our belief with what God says is true. And then faith, believing that because of Jesus, the good news, the gospel, that God loves us, he's empowered us, and he'll give us the ability to do it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said that that repentance and faith are the wings on which a Christian flies. So it's repentance, changing a mind, believing through faith that God will do for us what we need him to do so that we can live our lives in such a way that the kingdom of God is at hand within us. That God wants to come and save us, empower us, and rescue us and change us forever. So John says, believe, or Mark says, believe the gospel. Believe the gospel is a person. Believe that person is Jesus Christ. And that this gospel, this good news, this God, this Jesus is a better Adam who used his sonship for God's glory, perfectly submitting to God in everything. That this Jesus, this gospel, is a better Israel who perfectly displayed what God's really like. He's a true and better king who overcame Satan and sin for us. And he is the ultimate servant who lays down his life. Don't we have a great king? All of that is through the path of the cross. So I'm really excited for the next few months and whatever God has in store for us as we travel through the book of Mark. And my hope and my prayer is that as we are, as we are confronted with areas of our lives where we're not believing the gospel, and I'm not talking about affecting our salvation, I'm just talking about wandering in the wilderness, stumbling about, stiff-necked, stubborn for 40 years, it doesn't have to be that way. And through a life of repentance and faith, through a life of continued surrendering to the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we can live a life that is changed, transformed, in a life where God will use us to be agents of his transformation by his grace. Because the king is that good, and we can trust him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gospel. We are so grateful that the gospel is not just this set-off abstract idea, but that the gospel, the good news, is your son, Jesus. Leaving heaven in worship and adoration and coming to earth, taking on flesh, identifying with us in our brokenness through baptism. That you might live, Jesus, this perfect life that we cannot live. That you would be a better Adam. You would be a better Israel. You would be a better king. Where all of those things and people have fallen short and failed, you have not, and you will not. 
And so today, Lord, we change our minds. We repent to believe the gospel in every facet of our lives. And Father, I I pray that in the areas of our lives where we are just far too comfortable, you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit and you would convict us. That you would overwhelm us today, showing us that there's a better way. It's the King's way, and it's always the way to the cross. And Father, in the areas where we are struggling, where we are experiencing suffering and difficulty, would you come by your Spirit and would you comfort us? Would you overwhelm us with the good news, with yourself, Jesus, that you've already done everything necessary for us to receive all that you have for us? And would we believe in faith that it is already ours? Because of what you've done on the cross, Jesus, when you said, it is finished. Thank you that you are a great, good king. And that we can trust you. And so today we repent and we believe for the kingdom of heaven is here in our hearts, in our lives. Come and have your way. It's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. On the night before Jesus would be betrayed and ultimately led to the cross, he gathered together with his disciples to have a Passover meal. And Jesus broke from hundreds of years of tradition and and, and really instituted what we now know as the Last Supper, as the Lord's Supper, as communion or the Eucharist. And the night that Jesus would be betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he says, this bread represents my body, broken for you, identifying with you, identifying with your brokenness. Likewise, he took the cup and he lifted it. And he says, this cup represents a new promise, a new covenant, a greater covenant than that which we entered into in Sinai, a covenant that means that because of my sacrifice and the shedding of my blood, there can be forgiveness of sin once and for all. And so today I invite you to repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. To change your mind in whatever area the Lord is leading you to. And then to respond in faith by getting up out of your chair. The way that Jesus got up out of the grave. And coming and feasting on his love. The king, Jesus. The good news, the gospel, Jesus. His body broken for you. His blood shed for you. Come, feast on his love. The table of the Lord is open. Let's enjoy his mercy. grace and mercy there is nowhere we can hide from your love steadfast never failing you are faithful all creation is in awe of who you are You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we sing of all you've done. Eternity, we will sing of all you've done. We sing, God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us. Your heart, it moves with compassion. 
come against. No one can stand between us. God with us. God for us. Nothing can come against. No one can stand between us. 